boy, it sure was nice of Bob 8 to stay outside in the cold and, you know, work on our ship's engine while we stayed inside and, like, goofed around, you know? Yeah, that Bob 8 is pretty cool. Way better than original Bob. Oh, dude, for sure. He really is an ice guy. Ice guy. Ice guy. Cooler bot. Was that... Was that a pun? What are you talking about? I just think Bob 8 really goes with the flow. Go to your room. Cut to me re-recording Go to Your Room seven times while I edit this later. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Welcome to Crew Expendable. I am Guy, who did a Google search for water puns, Hallstrom. And I am baseball fanatic Rohrbacher. Hey, I used that one earlier. There's only so many, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, uh, because the thing of it is, is uh, spoiler alert, listeners, we're doing uh, Alien Descendant issue four, which, you know, of course, as normal for a new issue is a live read. And so we don't know what's in the comic. Yeah. So I can't really pull anything from it to come up with a title. So I was like, what's something from this comic that happened? And I was like, oh, yeah, that little Utani guy loves baseball. I'll just <laughs> go with that. <laughs> I just thought maybe since last episode, you got really into baseball. Nope. Uh, I am extremely not a sports guy. I do not care about baseball at all. And I just want to make that clear. That was a reference to this comic, <laughs> not my interests outside of the show. And we are, I'm going to finish the intro, collectively one single giant tick-like alien xenomorph hybrid busting through the frozen waters of the alien universe. We're exactly like that. It is a one-to-one -one comparison. That's that's what we are. We are collectively one giant monster. We literally are that. And I am not saying literally to mean figuratively. We <laughs> literally are that. Yes. I'm not going to go into the details. It involves uh, most of our existence ex existing in a, a sixth dimension that is... Uh, that human humankind can't comprehend or perceive, but uh, that's where most of us is located. Correct. Yes, we're Tralfamadorians, is what we are. <laughs> that's exactly precisely correct. Uh, off to a great start, Kenny. Oh yeah, I'm I'm loving this episode so far. <laughs> we're definitely not on one, that's for sure. No, I uh, I've only had one cup of coffee. I just finished eating lunch like ten twenty minutes ago, so I hear you. Nice. Before we actually uh, get into the contents of the comic proper, though, yes. there are uh, one or two little uh, news reports that I want to cover. Oh, okay, cool. Um, first off, and most directly related to the show, um, I believe they confirmed the other day that the new Alien movie the Fede Alvarez one that comes yes. out in August as of this recording. It's, I believe its official name is Alien Romulus. Yes. That had been the working title of it for a while, but I think they just announced that actually is going to like officially be the release title. So. Was it, was it Damien who posted that, who shared that? And that's how I found it. I, I believe so. Yes. Shout out to Damien. Um, uh, the second thing is that they recently announced that Dan Trachtenberg, the director of Prey, is uh, going to be making another Predator movie. They just announced Hell it yeah. a couple of days ago. Um, it is not going to be a sequel to Prey. It's going to be called Badlands, and it's apparently yes. going to be taking place in the future. In the, I think they said the near future. Is that accurate? Or the not-too-distant um, future? I did not catch that either way. They just said it was going to take place in the future. That's what I remember them saying. Okay. I like that as an idea better than the other thing that was floating around, which was, um, I don't remember the character's name, the French man with the yeah. pistol. Yeah. And the pistol shows up in Predator 2 and the character was in Prey that they were going to do a story based on his experiences. I don't think I'm less interested in anything than that honestly <laughs> like no i mean we as far as i'm concerned we got his the story in prey you know <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 i i, I don't need that um uh, near future sounds interesting right we haven't really had that in a predator movie it's all been sort of present day stuff so this is an and or you know in history like in um like in prey right in the past For so sure. i like the idea of a, of a future 
uh, Predator story. Especially because even like, I mean, so many of the Alien versus Predator comics, for obvious reasons, are in the future as well. Mm-hmm. But the movies weren't. The movies were still yeah. present day, you know? For sure. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm interested in this. I'm, you know, I'm, I've seen all the predator things. Obviously I'm a fan of the series, but I'm, I am more excited about Romulus than I am about a new predator movie. Same. Just at my core, you know, but I am glad that, uh, that they're moving forward with new interesting, uh, predator features because man, prey was good. And prey was real good. Um, the uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is this actually happened uh, several days ago as of this recording. Yes. But I believe this is the first time we've recorded since it happened. So this is the first time we've had the chance to mention it. But uh, a m- huge, sincere RIP to the man, Carl Weathers. Yes. Yeah, man. It, it happened. He died like around a week and a half ago as of this recording but like i said uh this is the first time we've had the chance to talk about it i uh you know of course we met we would talk about him because he was in predator sure but um after a couple of days after he died i was like you know what uh, I haven't seen any of the Rocky movies either, so oh, I'm wow. going to start watching those. And folks, the first Rocky movie, because I, as of this recording, I've only seen the first one yeah. yet. But uh, that first Rocky movie, I cannot believe how good it is, man. It is it is uh, an incredible movie, yeah. And Carl it Weathers is... is he's, it, yeah. he's phenomenal in it. He's great in it. It's one of those things where, like, I went into it thinking there was going to be more boxing in it than there actually was. <laughs> I like, I didn't know the movie was just like a character study of this schlub, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I watched it and like, I, like at first I was like antsy for more boxing. Then by about halfway through the movie, I realized that like how phenomenal Sly Stallone's performance in that movie had kind of like wormed its way into my brain. And so I was just like on board for just watching him act. And then uh, you finally get to the end of the movie and the last 20 minutes of it is just 20 minutes of two dudes punching each other in the face. (laughs) And it's like the final, like the final boxing scene is so good. It was worth sitting through like, you know, over an hour and a half of seeing no boxing to get to it. Like it was worth the wait. Sure. And like, I could not believe how good both of them were in that. Like, you know, since we're here specifically to talk about Carl Weathers, right. He does a phenomenal job, but like both of them just knock it out of the fucking park, dude. They do. And, And I would argue that the, that a big part of the reason that the boxing match is so good is because you've gone through all of that character development and stuff. Like I, I think also yeah, they're true, yeah. sure they're objectively good parts separately, but they're made better by each other as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, since we're talking about this in the context of the fact that Carl Weathers just died, yes. I wanted to focus specifically on how good he is in that movie. He's in it less than I thought he would have yeah. been going in, but it's like, you know, He's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I'm the heavyweight champion. I'm going to come here and, you know, it's the American dream. I'm going to find some unknown guy to box me. And then it's like you see all the other stuff of him, like, you know, setting up and arranging all the promotions and everything. And there's that one scene of like Rocky on the news, like boxing the frozen meat. And the dude's (laughs) like, hey, Apollo, come over and check this guy out. This guy you're fighting is on the news. and He's like for real. And then they don't even have an insert shot. He just his voice comes from off screen oh yeah i'm taking it seriously too and then just like goes back to his notes yeah and then like during the match sly knocks him down in round one and then apollo gets up and he's like who the fuck is this guy (laughs) it just everything about it was phenomenal like you know it's been a few days since i watched it like i think as of today i think it was like tuesday or wednesday that i watched it yeah and like I'm still thinking about it, dog. Yeah, it's a good movie. I haven't watched that in quite a while. Um, you're making me want to to uh, turn it on. My plan is to watch all nine of them. Is what I'm Hell going yeah. to do. So, but, I don't think uh, I've seen. I think I've seen maybe the first three. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've, I haven't. I haven't seen. I'm presuming you're. If there's nine, you're including the Creed 
movies as well. Uh, I, I am, haven't seen any I, am, of, yes. I haven't seen any of those. So maybe maybe I'll take this journey as well. We'll see. I uh, I I didn't really have anything else to say. I just that's that was been what's you know that's what has been immediately on my mind. Sure. Re Carl Weathers because I've seen Rocky more recently than I watched Predator last. Right. You know so. <laughs> I remember, I, man, I'm going to assume it was Saturday Night Live, but it also feels like it might have been a mad TV thing instead. Mm-hmm. Carl Weathers wasn't, he, he just did a, this one sketch for one of those two shows. He wasn't like the host, right? He wasn't like on yeah. the cast. Uh, I don't think he's ever been on the cast of a sketch comedy television series. I, I don't think um, he was either, no. But it was after Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected governor of California, right? All right. And Jesse Ventura okay. was ele- elected governor of some place. I think it had. I think it was Minnesota. I yeah. Think. And so the the idea was Carl Weathers was was just going to run to be governor of wherever state he lived in, and his entire platform was that he was also in Predator. <laughs> like <laughs> that's, that was the that's sketch. A good bit. He's that's like vote bit. vote for me for governor because I was also in Predator. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very good bit, not going to lie. That's all I remember of it, but I think about it every time I think about Carl Weathers or the movie Predator. But yeah, I mean, like I said, he was great. He was great in uh, Predator, which is relevant. I'm mentioning because it's relevant to the show. But yeah, he was, a, by all accounts, a great dude. Everyone seemed to like him a lot. And so sincere R.I.P. to Carl Weathers. Sincere R.I.P. to the man Carl Weathers. But we are not a predator show. We are an alien show. Not this episode, anyway. We will. We will down the line be a predator show for a while. Yeah, temporarily. And, and yes, we are occasionally a predator show, but we are primarily an alien show by design. Which is correct. Yes. So I think we should jump into um, Alien Number Four, Alien Descendant, Part Four of Four, the uh, from from Twentieth uh, Century Studios in association with Marvel Comics, written by Declan Shalvey. Present day art by Andrea Bracardo. Flashback art by Declan Shalvey. Present day colors by Ruth Redmond. And flashback colors also by Declan Shalvey. Letters by Clayton Cowles, of course. Uh, and a cover by Javi Fernandez and Matthew Wilson. And what a cover it is. This is a good cover. So this is this is the fourth issue, right? But this is the, mm-hmm. I think I counted the tenth issue in this ongoing LV six nine five thaw annual descendant like storyline right that is correct yes that we that I think it's safe to say we've both been really enjoying the mm-hmm. the entirety of right that also I would agree yeah. to that yeah I know when we listened or when when we listened to when we did our uh, episode our issue three episode we were a little bit like I don't know how this is gonna play out how this is gonna I don't know if it's gonna stick the landing we're kind of not feeling this. And then that that issue ended up being like fantastic, and we were mm-hmm. both like mm-hmm. fully charged up for issue four. Baby, I was in by the time I was done with that. Yeah. Which I mean is kind of a dumb thing to say when you're one issue away from the end, but like still, you know. Sure, but like I mean, that, when you're talking about a four issue series, too. Yeah, I mean, because that's the other thing, like. In most circumstances, after you're done reading the third issue, yeah. you're entering the second half of the comic. Right. So it feels a lot more reasonable to be like, oh, yeah, I'm in because you still have three issues left. But it's like we were 75 percent of the way through the story and like, I don't know about this. But then it turned it around. Yeah, we hit the the, the climax right to um to uh, yeah. reference slaughterhouse five a second time the guy stole the teapot yeah that's correct that's for all my slaughterhouse five heads out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I i'll be honest here man i i am thinking back and i'm thinking about like how quickly issue two ran by i don't know how many pages of story we're really getting in these things i don't think we're getting a whole lot of story pages in these alien books right now or in i would say we're not in books in general so i do feel like man there's a lot of ground to cover here in issue four, um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it it uh it pays off because like this is this isn't issue four, this is essentially issue ten, you know. Also correct, yeah. So there's a lot of history here that's got to get kind of tidied up, and some revelations just reintroduced or introduced for the first time in the last issue, like mm-hmm. um like Dayton's history as a synthetic on a mining operation who allowed a xenomorph to escape and kill a whole bunch of people. 
And yeah. th- that being the reason that um, June Yutani brought this expedition to LV-695 in an effort to recover Dayton. Like, that's the reason they were going to um, raise the Boreas in the first place until he realized that Dayton was over in the keg by following yeah. Zasha. There's a little re- yeah, doing sure. a little recap here. Yeah, it turns out uh, Dayton was the reason he was there. He couldn't have cared less about the actual ship itself. Who knew? Right. So I'm excited about this, but it, like, and this, but it, but I'm also like, how how does this how does this tie up? Right. We've got the giant. Yeah, we sure. got the giant tick monster. I'm going to keep calling it that. Um, yeah. Nobody's corrected us so far. I hope no one does, because by this point, that is the insistent terminology that we have grown accustomed to. So. Yeah. We've got the Boreas crashed and overran by Xenomorphs and all of the other people on this uh, expedition, all of those red shirts dealing with that. And then we've got Jun Yutani and uh, his synthetic assistant, Iris, facing off, I guess, with Zasha and Dayton. Dayton, who was mm. barely hanging on, right? Dayton, who was missing limbs and parts of his body and has rigged himself yep. up to power yeah, supplies his, his, to stay alive. His... Uh, his upper half is currently attached to the ship battery to keep him alive. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I, we've done, we've done a bit of a recap, but I do think since this is the, the kind of, but as far as we know, the finale of this entire storyline on LB six, nine, five, maybe I'll read the, the synopsis they give us on the credits page here. Works for me. Uh, just to get everybody caught up this way. Right. <clears throat> mm-hmm. In 2122, the multinational corporation Wayland yutani diverted their commercial towing vehicle, the Nostromo, to the moon LV-426. Wayland yutani purporting to answer a possible distress call, secretly wished to secure specimens of a dangerous alien species known as xenomorphs for study and profit. Tragedy struck the crew. In 2179, a colony known as Hadley's Hope, built on LV-426, was overrun by xenomorphs. All rescue attempts failed. All right, so again, they're only referencing Alien and Aliens in these books. We haven't gotten any Alien 3 references. I, I guess, as, you know. As far as I know, that's true. I can't remember any. So, But we've seen Pathogen and stuff crop up, right? Mm-hmm. We sure have. Continuing on. In 2195, scientist Batya Zahn discovered xenomorphs on the icy moon LV-695. Hundreds were freed from the ice, along with a hybrid pale-colored xenomorph with equally vicious tendencies. Every human on the moon was killed except for Batya's teenage daughter, Zasha. Now the year is 2208. Zasha, in disguise as Cole, was heading a mission to pull a Wayland yutani ship, the Boreas, from the ice on LV-695. Jun yutani himself arrived to ensure its success. Then Zasha went AWOL, setting off for her family's old base to recover Dayton, a synth who sacrificed himself to ensure her escape 13 years prior. Uh, Dayton, her essentially stepfather in that storyline. They're kind of leaving that out here. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, that's correct. Uh, their reunion was cut short by Jun Yutani, who revealed that Dayton was once his property, and that Dayton's past is darker than he's been letting on. Meanwhile, Zasha's team was attempting to raise the Boreas when swarms of xenomorphs and pale-colored hybrids attacked. As the humans fended off the aliens, the Boreas exploded in the crossfire. The wreckage crashed back into the ice, awakening the huge, deadly Winter Beast. They're calling it the Winter Beast. That's the big tick I'm, monster. I'm fine with that. That's kind of dope. I, I'm fine with that, yeah. too. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we need to call it something. It know? is a Winter Beast, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then our little infographic panel here. It's not an infographic this time. It is uh, Batia Zahn's Talbot Engineering Badge, splattered with presumably blood, identifying mm-hmm. her as chief scientist on assignment, Glacier Base 6, the keg LV-695, to provide water assets to numerous terraforming projects. Yeah, that was uh, officially the reason they were there to begin with. Yes. Was to basically uh, pack up ice and then ship it out to other places for water. Yes, which is a very cool sci-fi concept. I really like that idea. Aren't we Um, talking about, like, getting ice from Mars to, like, refill our, our water? Something like that, yeah. That's what they've said anyway. Uh, let's jump into this bad boy. All right, spoilers. Yeah, I, Spoiler I don't warning. think I have anything else, so let's do it. We've already spoiled the previous issues in this, right? We will be reading this on the podcast for the first time. Again, not reading it to you, but reading it and reacting to it and right. uh, discussing it as we go through. So uh, grab your copy and read along, or if you don't want it spoiled, uh, go read the book and then come back, right? Or if you don't care about spoilers, just continue to listen. 
Yes. You know, and I'm looking at you out there, Aaron Barbary on Instagram. Shout out to you. We're about to spoil this comic. If you haven't read it, what's up? I don't know. I'm just doing shout outs to people. Fair enough. Uh, we're talking to you, uh, Matthew, who sent us a really nice email a couple of weeks ago that we uh, have drafted a reply to, but not sent. Yeah, we definitely yeah. Uh, wrote one and then uh, forgot to finish or send it. But uh, don't worry, we got your email, dog, and we liked it. Yes, yes, and, and we'll be in touch soon. Um, who else we got? I, I know there's others. Uh, shout out to to Tom, of course, for the podcast art, right? For sure. We'll get into that in the end. Um, yeah. You know, he's got a link in the description. We're never mentioning his name on this show again. That's right. He doesn't deserve yeah. it. <laughs> Tom, you're done. All right. Hi, Tom. How's it going? <laughs> now we're getting off the rails. Okay. Guys, These, you know these episodes are always a little loosey-goosey. They're fun, though. All right. Um, let's talk about this cover. We talked about it last time. We saw the, just the image, the splash image, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Of what it seems like uh, one of these pale hybrid uh, zine snow morphs, as I call them. Mm -hmm. uh, but a queen version, right? And it's big as hell. Big as hell. Uh, Zasha and Dayton with his legs back on, standing in the background. Uh, th mm -hmm. Three uh, Xenos in the front foreground, right? Some standard XX1 Yeah, ones. they're just... They're just regular ones, and they're going, eh, in yes. front of the queen while the queen's going, Arr. and And th that's how you can tell how gigantic this this queen is. Now, yeah, I don't know what they're doing. Remember last time I was complaining about the red text for the, yeah, the credits? Yeah, I was literally about title. to ask you. I was about to ask you, how do you feel about the yellow text v. the red text? Uh, it's like a mango yellow right it's yeah. leaning yeah. towards orange first okay when i had my windows phone all right beautiful mm -hmm. color for my tiles on my home screen this orange all right mm -hmm. for my uh for my xbox dashboard when it was when they were doing the the metro theme loved having it this orange this orange yellow color uh on the cover of my alien book not a big fan i don't know what they're doing man um, All right. Uh, since this is the last issue in this mini series, yeah. um, I suppose now would be the best time to bring it up. Uh, I guess I'm telling this to Neil, but I'm also <laughs> following up on this uh, to the listeners as well who also heard this conversation. It was red last issue, and it's like this orangish yellow in this issue. Right. Neither of those colors bothered me in the slightest, and I have zero <laughs> opinions about it either way. Neil is the only one that cares about what color the title font is. It, I don't know. It's, it is, it's just clashing it, it for does, me. It does not bother me at all. I it, it does not affect It does not affect me one way or the other. That's fine. Um, okay. I just, well, I, I wasn't like trying to like, I don't know, start an argument or whatever. Right. I just, I, you have an opinion about it. I don't. So since I don't really have anything to say about it, if you still do go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. I think ultimately what it's bought, what's bothering me about it is I'm not crazy about the sort of design overhaul that these color covers have gotten with this series where we've got the 20th century studios sort of banner right mm -hmm. and the little marvel logo at the bottom in this blue and teal i think that the covers are now clashing with that like the covers are not being drawn to incorporate those logo colors and i think the logo colors are very distracting if that makes mm -hmm. sense i think i probably wouldn't mind the text if there wasn't that teal and blue like right up above it right. but also the 20th century studios logo is white white text for the alien logo would have worked fine here and I, they, I like this better than the red last time. I give the red a pass because they were on a white background, more or less, in that for that cover. So they couldn't do white text, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I, th I just think that is like putting a highlighter over this uh, kind of bland logo a little bit. Like it is just alien, right? It's the creator's names and then it's alien spaced out so that the five characters go the entire length of the comic. So, like, there's huge spaces between them. And the font size is very, very small. It is not a powerful logo. Yeah, I mean, I will say... I would I would look better if the font of the word alien was larger. But like uh, listeners, if you're trying to picture it in your head, it is literally just uh, the one from the first movie. It's right. just that. It is. Uh, and That's all it is. Like, it just it it's it's but to Neil's point, it is a lot smaller. So the font size between the logo and uh, the creator names, there's a lot less of a like distance 
in the size of them. Mm -hmm. So they blend together in a way that, you know, doesn't serve the title because that should be like the first thing you notice. Right. And now it just kind of blends in because it's not, it's not as much bigger than everything else as it should be, yeah. you know? <laughs> now, now make no mistake. Like you, it, the fact that the logo isn't really jumping out at you, like you look at this book, you know, it's an alien book, right? Like you can tell. Well, yeah. Look, I mean, if the word alien and, and wasn't not, on the not cover, just because, know. yeah, not just because there's a xenomorph on the cover, but yes. <laughs> but if you, but if it didn't say alien, you would still look at this, any of these books and go, Oh, these are alien books. Right. Yeah. Like they, sure. they all have xenomorphs represented on the cover. But I, th I don't know. I just feel like the white, the white would have worked here. I'm going to, we're going to drop it. We're going to move on. Okay. Uh, you guys got opinions on this uh, mother at crookspendable.net. Let me know what you think, Tom, as an artist. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I just, I don't know what they're doing. Like it, the other thing is like, I don't know. We associate certain colors with the franchise and I know they go outside of that sometimes. Like they did use this orange a lot in the dark horse run for like, you know, a lot of the eighties and nineties books. I don't know. Maybe whatever. Nobody cares but me. So let's jump into this thing. Yeah, I'm not going to say you're overthinking it, but I will say that I think it's not as big of a deal as you're talking about it like it is. Yeah, well, I don't think we needed to spend 10 minutes on it, but we did. So I'm, <laughs> Fair enough. I'm, willing, to I, I'm I willing to drop it. I suppose in that sense, you have proven me wrong, I guess. So. I might edit that down in post, but let's... Uh, Let's, I mean, even if you don't, that's fine. Let's dig into this thing. R.I.P. Okay. Uh, uh, Apollo Creed. You you forgot his real name, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's Carl, Carl Weathers. Weathers. I know. I know. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, we start off, like you mentioned, it's the year 2208. We are still on Cochito, yes. i.e. LV695. That's where we're starting off. We're at the remains of the keg. The research base. Didn't think this story would end with me off the board. Again, these black, this 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 is uh, Zasha's monologue from what I can tell. Uh, 227N, that is Dayton's designation, his original synthetic designation on that mining yep. colony. Yeah, because the one thing you didn't mention in your uh, stuff, in your recap, was all of those flashback scenes right. to when a group of uh, synths were uh, basically digging some xenomorphs out of the rock. Yes. And it turns out uh, one of those uh, mining guys was designation 227N. And near the end of the previous issue, we found out that uh, that's who Dayton used to be. That's how the past storyline and the present storyline tied together. Right. And uh, listeners may remember it when I famously sent, what the fuck, out yeah. loud in the middle of the episode episode that, was, that was because i read that and went whoa okay yeah man uh good reveal good good twist yeah. in that one so it, yeah so it, it it fucking caught me off guard so here's june yutani saying like man you're still in the trash heap just where we left you so many years ago yeah. dayton's like it's been about 40 years you're as ruthless as your quote predecessor it seems remember how we were positing clone or synthetic or something yeah or uh, like you know in hypersleep so it didn't age or whatever yeah uh, the fact that predecessor is in quotes is leaning me towards a uh, clone same here but, yes we'll see and zasha's like lying there unconscious in the background yeah she got she got uh i i called it comic book hit by yep. iris and went flying in the last issue iris again is synthetic, she sure so she can yeah it may, now now i'm just thinking about the walter versus david fight from covenant <laughs> hell yeah of course you are you're thinking about david a lot so i'm <laughs> I, not surprised i think about walter more if i'm being honest uh, fair enough fair enough yeah so you're gonna use one but yeah uh zasha's regaining consciousness dayton's yeah dayton's trying to wake her up so that she can escape Right. And uh, June's like, it's fine. She can try to run. I'll just get her and kill her. It doesn't matter. Dayton's asking if this crew, this team he has, knows that they're working for June Yutani, quote, heir to the Yutani throne. But he's like, well, it doesn't matter. Your whole team's dead. 
Yeah, and uh, he uh, knows this because turns out that machine he's hooked up to isn't just a battery. It's also connected to comms. Yes. So he has wired himself into the ship systems and is able to monitor everything and tells June that the excavation's a failure and his entire crew has been killed. And something horrible it will soon be coming this way. Bam! Sasha, for the tackle against Iris, yep. takes her down. Hey, okay, good. Uh, I don't know if we knew this. I think we did. Dayton's legs are still hanging around here. He's got them plugged in as well, so that's good. Um, and then June says, nice try, Cole, or whatever your name is, which is something that I've been meaning to bring up. Yes. You... you have mentioned in previous episodes and even earlier in this episode that Zasha is going by the name Cole. Right. Is Cole supposed to be her first name or her last name? No idea. <laughs> is it supposed to be Zasha Cole or Cole Zahn or? Yeah. yeah I don't know. She just, I, I don't know either. <laughs> I'm thinking she it's, it's one of those situations where everyone just goes by their last names. Right. Which, that's fair which which is all of the alien movies and that's the reason yeah. why we're Hallstrom and Rohrbacher on this right that's true that's true um so I I don't think it I don't think she's using any part of her real name whatever she made up for a first name or a first initial I'm thinking Cole is her her last name her made up last name for this mission all right that's fair yeah uh, uh oh, it's a combat synth and it's gonna beat the yeah. shit out of Zasha now. Uh, yeah, I, Iris starts beating the fuck out of Zasha. That's fun. I had its personality <laughs> software deleted. More room for brutality. That's a that's and a Tani quote. And then I'm glad you mentioned that uh, <laughs> that Dayton's legs are still plugged in because while <laughs> Iris is distracted, uh, Dayton's legs come to life and wrap her up and try to pin her down. This fucking rules. That's awesome. <laughs> I really like that a lot. That's great. <laughs> um, one comment on the fact that he's he's like, yeah, I had my my combat sense personality removed so she can just fight and shit like. We we saw in that colony like the Utani's of you know, the, like Wayland Utani in general, but certainly this the Utani's specifically who was in charge of that mining co colony. They have no respect at all for synthetics, artificial persons, you know, any of that stuff. They just view them as machines. So like, of course, he removed the personality from his yeah. Why would combat he? synth? It's a tool. He doesn't want to it to empathize or have any feelings or anything. But uh, yeah, while she's wrapped up in Dayton's legs um, and Dayton goes on a little monologue about uh, like, you know, how they're real salt of the earth types and June doesn't know anything about his tall Damn. ivory towers and such. So we uh, didn't, Zasha we didn't grabs it. Be something better like you and your Utani cousins. This is good. Uh, Zasha grabs a big tube and starts uh, choking Iris around the neck with it. Whoa, and then rips her essentially like in half. Yep, pulls hard enough that she gets aliensed and rips in half at the waist rather than yeah. her head coming off, which I thought was interesting. We couldn't buy our way to a better world. We had to fight for it. So you want brutal? We can do brutal. Hell yeah. Uh, eat the rich, Dayton. Am I right? And then uh, that is said over this gigantic, uh, what was its name? The Winter Beast. The Winter Beast. beast. Uh, comes out of the ice looking for all the world like our just big spider with four legs. This thing rules. I love this thing. And it's crawling through this gigantic like valley gap in the ice Dude, it's towards like, uh, the yeah. ruins. It's marching towards the one two ones. All of the hybrid, all the pale Xenos are like marching with it, like underneath it. This yep. is this is sick. And then it comes up to uh, the regular, the one, two, ones, and they start shrieking at each other and then they get into a big fight. Hell yeah, they do. And uh, the Winter Beast is crawling around with a bunch of Xenos all over it. And uh, we get a cool foreground shot of um, one of the hybrids uh, ripping off a Xeno's arm while the Xeno tries to claw its face off. I'm noticing a new detail. Do these hybrids seem to have, like, fur on their backs? 
they sure do. I don't know if this is new for this issue or if we just didn't notice it in the previous ones. Or, but yeah, yeah. they have they have like a big like the entirety of their back, like where the tubes would normally come out on a regular Zeno. There's just a big swath of like prickly black fur on it. That's fun. I don't know where that detail came from because I don't remember the the. Yeah, neither do I. I don't know what to call whatever species the winter beast was derived from. Like, they didn't yeah. really have that. I guess they were a little fuzzy, maybe. Yeah. I don't I, know. I don't, really, I don't really remember either way, honestly, by this point. Yeah. I don't know. It makes sense for them as an Arctic species, right? Uh, we Then we get the credits page, which I uh, thoroughly discussed already. And then we are in 2168 at the Clowley Mining Colony. This is yeah, 227 in. This in, and we're with Dayton 227 in with his arm missing as a xenomorph. Yep. Uh, as the xenomorph closes in on him, and he's like, "Damn, I let my curiosity get the better of me." Never going to make that mistake again. As he's and, bleeding uh, out. Just as the xenomorph uh, swipes its tail forward to kill him. Um, what looks like June Utani yes. comes in with a bunch of dudes and it's like, stand down. This discovery is worth more than you are more than a hundred. And, uh, and then right as he, right as June or the guy that looks like June Utani says that two, two, seven hits a button while the uh, Xenomorph threatens him and everything Hell goes yeah. up in flames. He, he, he lights up whatever this is lights up that Xenomorph. It is burning. Yeah, uh, that's all right. That's the podcast art, I think. I would say there's there's a very cool panel of what looks like a xenomorph getting ripped apart by liquid flames. Yep. I mean, I mean, I know it's just like jets of flame, but due to the way the drawing looks, it looks like it's like molten lava or something. It's very cool. It's very cool. I'm dropping that. Uh, sorry, in our our little server here, so I can find it later. All right. No, Scree. I love the Xeno Scree. I love that that's been consistent since, like, the Dark Horse comics. Um, we uh, cut back to the present, and uh, June mocks them for wasting their time killing Iris when he has more. And Dayton's like, God, he's whatever got... you have at your home are leftovers from the real Utanis. This is interesting. This this Utani, this, I don't know what's going on with this family in this, right? Well, the, I bet we're about to find out. So I'm just listen. I, I know there. I'm sure the Utani's have been very heavily present in in Predator novels and things like that, as well as I mean Alien versus Predator and Alien novels too. The experience I have with them is the way that they were shown at the end of AVP Requiem, mm -hmm. and the which and the the Alien Covenant origins. Right, I forget mm -hmm. her name. Whatever Miss Utani was in that. Yeah, I don't remember either. And then the uh, aliens, uh, the one shot with the glow in the dark xenomorph. Aftermath. Aftermath. Yeah, when that was a Utani there, sort of pretending to be this the installation's computer system, right? The uh, it's wild because the company is omnipresent, but we don't really see a whole lot of individual named Utani people, right? Like that are that are actually like. Like, I don't mean like name people as in people with names from the company. I mean, people that are named Utani. That yeah. doesn't really happen that often, but it's happened a few times. <laughs> well, we know we've had so much Wayland, right? That's I mean, true. Charles Bishop Wayland, the, the Wayland Corporation or Wayland Industries or whatever it was called in Alien vs. Predator movie. Yeah, and then, there, there, are, there are multiple movies that have a Wayland in them as a character. Yeah, the, all the Peter <laughs> Wayland stuff from Prometheus and uh, you know, still spilled over into Covenant, right? A little, yeah. Actually, he, yeah, he was just straight up in the, op the first scene in Covenant. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> so, right. He was. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. You're right. Damn, um, I forgot about that. Shit. Yeah, and the, but the Yutanis, again, I know we look we haven't obviously we haven't read every novel or comic book series i'm sure this information is out there and we're going to get to it uh but yeah this is personally the most utani discussion i think i've encountered in anything so yeah yeah i'm kind of interested in how it'll line up with other things as we discover them or uh wh whatever I, you, you know what i'm saying i do you're a long way from home junior whatever you have there are leftovers from the real utani's 
And then uh, he says that June has no claim to the Wayland yutani throne, which leads me to believe that I'm probably wrong. My gut instinct of it being a clone is probably not correct. That sounds more likely that he is a synth. That you were doing whatever you could to buy your way in off our labor, all that money, and you're still so desperate. It's sad. No yeah, real Yeah, I got family. nothing to show for it. And then he says, all right, Zasha, that's your cue to get out of here. And she's like, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, and he insists. And then uh, Zasha calls June a huckster, which really made me laugh. <laughs> I This part, sorry, a, a few panels back where he's like, I got four more of Iris's at home. It's like such a spoiled kid thing of like, mm -hmm. I, I got mad and I smashed my PlayStation, but it doesn't matter because I have another one, you know? I, uh, I threw my controller, I was, right? I was reading this thing back a little while ago before uh, that show, that HBO show, show session ended. Succession, yeah. And and um, I was reading this thing about how a couple of the actors on the show said in an interview that uh, the show had to hire, I think the title they gave for them was Wealth Consultants. <laughs> and it was basically people that, taught the actors how to act rich holy smokes and and it was like what they would do is it was a bunch of little things like the examples they gave in the interview was if you're rich you never crouch or bend when you get out of a helicopter because you already know there's enough clearance. Um, there, there were three. There were three examples. That was the like. I mean, I'm That's... presumably the wealth consultants did more than just this, Holy but shit. in the interview, these are the examples they gave of the type of stuff they were taught. Um, they never crouch when they get out of a helicopter. Um, they never wear jackets because they always just either go from the plane to the car and okay. then from the car to their house. They're never outside no long enough to need a coat, so they never wear right. coats. And the big thing that is the reason I'm bringing this up now is the third thing they cited in the interview is that no rich person ever has a case on their phone because if they break it, they'll just immediately buy a new one and it doesn't matter. That's wild. And so you saying he's like, oh, he's a spoiled rich kid. He's like, oh, you broke my iris. That's fine. I have another one at home. Yeah. And so that just reminded me of that thing I was reading from when Succession came out. He's like, I'll just go get a new Iris Pro yeah, 20 or whatever. Much. So but, it's, uh, so on the subject, that, that phone thing is crazy because I went through a number of years where I didn't have cases or screen protectors on my phone because I didn't want them. I just didn't like them. Mm -hmm. And I would just, my phone would just get beat up or whatever, and it was fine. And if my screen got a little scratched, it was okay. If the screen ever, like, and my screen's never broke either. And, like, mm -hmm. folks, I, I work construction. I wasn't, you know, I mean, I was, <laughs> they were in some rough areas. But I had to adopt to uh, cases once they started making all of, like, the entire outside of your phone out of glass, right? <laughs> then I was like, oh, well, this sucks. Now I have to have a case. And ain't that the truth? Anyway. Um, like I said, uh, Zasha calls June a huckster. And yeah. then in talking to June, um, June the actual dialogue boxes that Dayton says, June has quotes around it, which again leads me to believe it's not actually his real name. Yeah. Uh, furthering my belief that he's actually a synth because the same thing happened with Dayton. June started calling Dayton, like in the speech bubbles, Dayton had quotes around it. Yeah. And so I'm assuming the same reveal is about to happen here. We'll see. Um, I like that he's telling, he's like, Zosh, you have to leave. Things are in motion and there's no stopping them. Like he knows, like, again, because he's plugged into everything, like he's surveying the whole situation. Yeah. Um, uh, Dayton straight up says, this is where it ends for me, but it's fine. Um, you've given me a real life, which is more than synths ever get. I, and I even got to see you one last time. But if you don't go now, you're going yes. to fucking die. So just steal June's ship and escape. So, and he says that he wants uh, her to take June's ship because he can lock into the comms there yeah. and like guide her through and everything. And keep using your ship to interface with a descendant in orbit. I like, okay, yeah. so he does say... I've had a better life than I deserve all because of you and your parents. This is, I was reminding me that I was going to look this up and I didn't, but I think from context clues, I have figured out that, uh, uh, they knew Batia knew that Dayton was a synth. 
Dayton knew that he was a synth in Thaw, right? And it was yeah. after Zasha's yeah. father died, he sort of slid in and took over the identity, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Zasha didn't really know because she was still, you know, young or young whatever. Enough, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that, yeah, I was, I remember was, I was questioning that last time and I forgot to go back and check it out, but I'm glad that this book sort of covers those things. Uh, uh, and man, she's like, I can't say goodbye again. And he said, then, then don't just go, man. I am, and then she runs. I am feeling this. I, this, I mean, I've just got to say 10 issues of this, like their d- relationship yeah. really has developed and I really am like invested in, in the Dayton Zasha bond, man. I will say though, uh, I will point out for the listeners the way it works is there's a close up of Zasha saying, Not fucking again. I can't say goodbye again. And then there's a close up shot of Dayton with a hilarious, like proud dad look on his face. L- and he's little. like, Yeah. Then then don't just go. And then the next panel is her running out of the door with June Utani in the background watching her go. Yeah, and okay. why didn't he fucking try to stop her? She's just too fast, man. It is a little, the pacing here is a little, okay, put my critical hat on here for a minute. As much as I am enjoying this, this is very slow. Mm-hmm. There is a lot of time for Zasha and Dayton to be talking to each other while Jun Yutani is just standing there doing nothing about any of this. Uh, yeah, right? I'm looking through it right now. Um, let's see. Now, to his credit, um, like uh, the two of them are standing there talking while June is just watching them yeah. for literally two entire pages. <laughs> but he has he's got no backup. He's got nothing to do. He doesn't know where to go or what to do. Right. He knows something is coming that they're not going to be able to avoid. He's not making an effort to escape because for whatever reason, he's got to finish whatever this beef is with June. Or with uh, Dayton, I think you're. I do think you're right about maybe because he's a synth, he's not worried about the monsters, right? Mm-hmm. If he's a synth, that is, I don't know. It, but like, it it works and it doesn't work at the same time. Well, it just, ultimately, it I'm was fine weird. With it. It was weird to me because at the beginning of the conversation, yeah. June's like, don't even try to escape. We'll kill you. And then Dayton's like, well, all your guys are dead. And June's like, oh, I don't care. I'll stop you myself. And then when Zasha runs away, i.e. the moment where June does actually have to try to stop her, he just watches her run out of the door. Go after her, dude. It's yeah. not like Dayton's going anywhere. You've nothing. Well, you know, but he also did get a hell of a dressing down from from Dayton about how he's nothing and he can't do anything. And but like, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If June is as stuck up and as haughty as the comic makes it clear, he doesn't like he as according to him, Dayton's not even alive or real and is literally just a piece of machinery. Right. Why would he care that much about what, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, I, yeah. Let's, let's find out. Let's finish reading this and find out. Yeah. We're, we're not, we're not done. They might talk about it later. So. There might be an answer. Uh, the, um, the winter beast with xenomorphs all over it, attacking it is, is very near to the keg and is kind of yeah. making a break for it. It's weird that he knows it's, He's got like yeah. a goal in mind. It's pretty upset. It has, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Xenos just hanging off of it. And you can really, again, get a good sense of like how big this thing is. It's kind of got like a T-Rex head, doesn't it? Kind of, yeah. In, in profile, but with like extra eyes. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. I, lo- I do love yeah, this it, thing. It approaches the keg, and as it runs forward, a bunch of the xenomorphs get knocked off from presumably the speed or whatever. Right. And then uh, June, it cuts back to June and Dayton, and June just like, now what? And yeah. also, I like how when we see Dayton in profile, he has one of those plugs just plugged right. directly into the back of his Dude head. Jacked, that really makes me laugh. Jacked into the Matrix. Um, yeah. And he's like, yeah, we wait for that giant monster to come for us with all its deranged cousins in tow. And now June's like, okay, let's do a deal. I'm a fraud. I'm a Utanian name, but far removed from the line that became Wayland Utani. I've been coasting off the name my whole life while cashing in on it, too. So so he's like a seventh cousin or something. Got you, it. You've got me, but I am still very wealthy. Let's get to a ship and draw a line. Okay, on, under all of this. Um Okay, here we go. 
All right. He literally says, wealth, a wealthy man, we both know you're not even human. And then uh, I think he's in, I, in. And then he says, in those 30 seconds you were trying to bargain, I armed a nuke and launched it. Hell Ooh, yeah. Baby. God damn it, Dayton. This time you can join and then me he in says, the trash Yeah, heap. this time you can join me in the trash heap. Missile deployed. Impact eight minutes. He's saving All right. and Zasha and Zasha's again, running her ass her off. Escape. He's doing it. He's yeah. saving me. A decade later, he's still saving me. She's outside the keg at the ship, and she sees the winter beast coming. Yeah, she she can see the silhouette of the winter beast stomping her way towards her, and she's like, ah, shit, what am I going to do? She, like, looks up and sees the rocket flying through, the nuke flying through the air. Yeah. And, uh... Man. And then it cuts back to June, and he picks up his baseball bat and just starts beating the fuck out of Day- Dayton's torso with it. I'm not going to get into it because, again, I think everybody should read this. Um, but these moments where Zasha's having this monologue about how she returned here, she spent her whole life trying to get back, and now she's leaving, and she's just thinking about family. There, I, I really like these. The I, I, I like her motivations, and I like reading her thoughts and stuff. I, I don't know. This is, a, this is a well-written book, and I don't think that always comes across in the way we discuss it. So I just want to very clearly say, like, I really enjoy the writing and the the layering of the story in this. Meanwhile, yeah, June's beating the shit out of Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, yeah, uh, June's beating the shit out of Dayton, knocking him around, uh, you know, getting pissed off that he has the temerity to try to lecture him. Yeah, and... Uh, He's like, I could have used the information to get back in the good graces of the, you know, the yes. Utani line of my family. But, you know, it's all fucked up thanks to you and Zasha. Yeah. And he says, you think you're better than me? Dayton, that's not even your real name. You don't have a name. And then uh, Dayton goes, yeah, I do. And then Zasha Bam. comes out of nowhere with a rock and goes, dad, and then cracks June in the back of the head with a rock. Hell yeah, knocks, it, knocks his ass out. Hell yeah, Zasha. This is, yeah, this is interesting. So he was like, I was going to give my cousins their, the Boreas back, and that was going to get me back in their good graces. So all of that cousin talk was literal cousin talk. It wasn't like, you know, your other clones or whatever. Meanwhile, four minutes to uh, impact. The winter be- the yeah, winter the Winter beast. beast is still running along, impact four minutes, like you said. And, uh, uh oh, something's starting to bulge out of the back of the Winter Beast. Oh, shit. Oh, no. But before we see that, we're going to cut back to uh, whatever year the it past. was. Yeah, 2168. Uh, 2168 on Clowley, the Clowley mining colony. We got it. Uh, June, the June here in the past describes it as a disaster. A Take the out junk here. out of here. Get me his file. And uh, they drag 227N away. Begin to search for more of those eggs. As of now, that's what we're mining for. So that wasn't the goal, but it is now the goal. So this and might then have they been... just uh, they toss him into a big bin, like a big bucket filled with a bunch of other, Jesus. presumably like the rest of the yeah. uh, synth miners. And then they're loaded onto a big ship and flown away. There's like dumpsters full of these synth yeah, miners. Like, they're yeah, just burning I, through. Yeah, them. I said like bin, but the word I was looking for was dumpster. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it flash forwards a bit to 2184 Man. on an outer rim planet, Lina 349. Oh, this is fun. And and Dayton uh, looks the way we're familiar with him looking with like the hair and the beard and everything. Missing his and arm. And he still, he still only has the one arm. Where'd I leave that fluid top up? Wow. Does he, do the synths have to drink? Uh, yeah, like the way the panel is drawn and the way like the, uh, you know, his dialogue is written and stuff. It leads me to believe they're trying to like make a comparison here between like an alcoholic or a drug addict or something. Yeah. And then, uh, and then it cuts to, uh, Batya and the real Dayton and young Zah while Batya is like, Hey, is like, hey, friend, need some help? <laughs> Actually, need a job? Man. And they're wearing their Talbot engineering coats and yep. everything. This is, they're really wrapping I it up it. here. I knew it. 
Yeah, you called okay. it. Okay. Yep. We 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 cut back to the present, and June is lying there, and there's a big gaping wound on his head, and white blood is coming out. Jesus, I thought I I, did, I thought I killed a human. Didn't want that to be my last act in life. Zosh is relieved. Oh, good. I only I only killed a synthetic. Yeah, he Syn- even synthetic says dad. He... Hey, synthetic dad, don't worry. I only killed at one of you. <laughs> and Dayton says, yeah, he had to be because he's literally the same person I knew decades ago. Somehow the same Man. age. Who knows? Um, and she said, you know, he's like, you know, there isn't enough time. I can't stop it. And she's like, you know, that's fine. I don't care. I'm not leaving you. It doesn't matter what happens to me anymore. Came here to find I don't you, care. Not to leave you again, no matter what. We don't have much time. I just want to spend it with you, Jesus. As and w- while this while this dialogue is happening, there is a bigger and bigger sound effect happening across the bottom of the panel. We start, to and see then it yeah, collapse. the rumble, the rumble gets big and loud enough to take up the entire panel. While they're while Dayton's like, "Your mother would be proud," and the building is collapsing around them. And then it cuts to outside, and the winter beast is dying as a winter beast size hybrid xenomorph breaks out of its back. Yeah. Impact six seconds. Presumably, this is the the queen that we saw on the uh, on the cover, right? Because we did see. I'm hoping so. We we did comment in the annual that it, it looked like the Alien Three logo in the chest of this thing, and yeah. uh, that that was also a queen embryo, right? So. And yeah, but uh, uh, everything just yeah. sort of collapses. Xenomorphs yep. of all different types sort of screeing at each other as uh, we fade to white, presumably the explosion, which did not strike the keg, but it stroke it struck, I guess, the Boreas site. Probably. I, I'm not exactly sure where it landed. They don't say or anything. And then uh, it cuts to Earth one month later. And uh, we see a close up of June Yutani standing with a group of people that, uh, as it pans out, we see is a photo. Yeah, I can, and we have a repeat of his monologue. I came here to open your brain. What he was saying to Dayton. Yeah, the monologue that he was saying while he was beating Dayton with a baseball. It's all bat. gone to hell. You're a thief and a liar. You think you're better than me, Dayton. All of the same exact dialogue that we read earlier in the issue. And somebody is. And to the point where uh, he says, you don't even have a name. And then we hear Dayton say, yes, I do. And Zasha say, dad, we find out that somebody is listening to all of this. Somebody with a Wayland yutani hat on their desk and a pair of earbuds in a, on a Wayland yutani uh, t- computer yep. terminal logging in as June Utani. Yep. Is this old man June Utani? I'm assuming the June Yutani from the flashbacks was the real actual person that has grown up to be this guy. Wild. And so he like made a synthetic version of young him, I guess. I don't know. Unlike some, I didn't have a long life. The things most important to me, I mostly took for granted until they're all um, taken away from me. We, this but, is more Zasha. But yeah, he's. He's uh, standing, uh, old Jun Yutani is standing in an office building looking out a window while he logs into a Wayland Yutani panel and deletes all of the Operation Descendant files. Deleting files. 135 of 12,087. Yep. That's a lot of files. And we get a nice uh, Zasha monologue as we, as this story ends. I'm, and I, we have a we have like a splash panel of Batia, Zasha, and Dayton over the planet with the ship in front of them, just like a check these guys out reminiscent panel. Now we're all uh, together again, buried in a silent cold. Uh, the end. <laughs> we do see the Yutani ship. I mean, there's no way they got out of there, right? Oh, they're dead as hell. I mean, no. like we like we saw them standing in a collapsing building, and then the next panel said impact six seconds. They're dead as hell, dog. But again, I don't think that the the bomb was coming for the keg. It was coming for the, I don't know, man. Yeah, they yeah, they're dead as hell unless they're not right. <laughs> like I I mean, unless they reveal that like the explosion, uh, like the nuke landed far enough away that it didn't kill them, I guess. But then what would have been the point of launching it? You and know? I don't and I don't see any way that Zasha could have gotten Dayton out of there either with yeah. him being in pieces. And, you know, yeah. So I think that they're I think that they're man. What an end. Oh, yeah. They're they're 
Yeah, th- th- this, as far as I'm concerned, this comic ends with Zasha dying. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> All right, so we got to talk about this thing now in the context of the entire Thaw and Descendant run. I don't think we can talk. I mean, I think as an ending to this Descendant storyline, this is fine, right? I think yeah. I think you have to, though, view these two series as, as one continuing series. You know, I did say what was carrying me through the early issues of Descendant was the stuff from Thaw, right, the, that was remaining. I don't think this stands well on its own. This is very clearly a continuation of that storyline. It has to be. Like to Agreed. the to the point where we're seeing, you know, Dayton get hired by Batia, you know. Like as a whole, this is this is really, really good. <laughs> I really like this series. I, I think it might be you know, and we've said this before, this ultimately I think might be the best of the Marvel run. Do you like Descendant more or less than Thaw? I like Thaw as a whole better i like descendant as i think descendant is a very good epilogue to thaw does that make sense it does yeah i don't think descendant works on its own is kind of my point i think it needs to be connected i think i like the thaw i like but i mean again as a whole i like the way the whole thing unfolds and the way all of this information is revealed to us the way we learn about dayton and we learn about and then we learn more about him in this and like like all of the reveals. I think the story unfolded the way that it needed to throughout this entire story arc. Mm-hmm. The monster stuff, uh, it turns out, as cool as it was, wasn't that integral to the whole plot. That's maybe the yeah, one Yeah, it turns thing. out it, yeah, it didn't really matter at all, really. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's alien. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that stuff, like I, I like that that stuff was happening and this stuff was happening, right? Like we got a very... Mm-hmm kind of personal story about Zasha and Dayton and Dayton's history and all of that stuff. And then we also got a whole bunch of really cool monster stuff that we got to see as well. The two in this didn't really blend together all that well or really at all, you know, Mm -hmm. but I, but ultimately I think I'm fine with that because I, I do like a story that is a really good story following some really interesting characters in some really interesting situations. And then also there's a xenomorph there, right? Yeah. I don't know. Like that's, that is the way some of this stuff is just going to be. It's true. Maybe I didn't express that in the, like the most accurate way, but I think, I think I got the point across. I would say you did. I mean, I knew what you meant, so it's all good. How do you feel about, about descendant on its own and in the context of the entire, uh, six, nine, five storyline? Well, it's one of those things where, like, I suspect that if I had just started reading uh, at Descendant number one, I would have been able to figure out what was going on. The reason why we're sitting here like, oh, you can't read it on its own is because we already did read the first one and knew that, you know, could see the connections and knew it was a follow up. But like, if you just came in blind to Descendant, it might take you an issue or two to really figure out what's going on but i believe you'd be able to orient yourself well enough sure but uh i do ultimately think i liked thaw more than i liked descendant descendant was good and it had a couple of moments in that four issues that are probably my at least one or two that were like my favorite moments of that entire 10 issue run yeah but of the two, I think Thaw ultimately was probably the stronger of the two. Uh, turns out that I guess uh, five issues for an alien miniseries is the sweet spot to me. Four mm-hmm. feels a little short, and six feels a little drawn out. Yeah, I will say I don't. I don't feel like anything in this really went unexplained in the four issue run. But I do think if they had a fifth, there might have been a way to pull the winter beast into the events on the keg in a more meaningful way than it shows up and then it dies and then a bomb goes off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And like the queen that birthed from the winter beast is in like literally two panels before it gets vaporized. Yeah. And like when the comic ends, we never figured out why June Yutani uh, sent a synthetic version of him at like 17 
to that planet. Like we never figured out why he did that or what he was trying to do. And uh, when he did that, like why he bothered, like, why did he delete the files? You know, like th there's a lot of stuff that it's like, we don't need the answers for it, yeah. but if they had done a fifth issue, there's stuff that we could have gotten more explanation for, you know? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, June Yutani shows up later. I wouldn't be surprised if we get some, and uh, maybe another annual. I don't know if that's the right thing. Where the, I wouldn't be surprised if that queen survived this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a nuke, um, but this is a hybrid, right? <laughs> like, who knows, you know? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't the end of the LV695 stuff. I do think, at the very least, the fact that they're bringing in Yutani's. I think that that June's going to show up in something else in the future, right? Mm -hmm. I, I or more about the Clowley colony, the the mining operation there is going to become more of a big deal because that does seem to be the first time they got a specimen, you know. Or we could be way overthinking it, and that flashback storyline only existed to set up. Uh, the characterization of Dayton in the present. Like, you know, that might be. be the only reason it's relevant or it might not be the only reason. Who knows? I feel like it's a lot. There's been a lot of time spent on this and a lot of attention paid to it to set these things up for them to the, just drop it. I mean, I know that that's what they did with the spinners, right? At the end of mm -hmm. Revival, I got the name right for once, you know. Sure um, did. Yeah, I mean, I know that that's kind of what they do, but this this just feels different, right? Because this was this is the longest consec like consistent story arc with the these same characters that Marvel has done so far, even though they split it into two series. Yeah. I don't, Cause I don't think that it's a sustain sustainable idea to just make a whole bunch of independent, different colonies with different first encounters with Xenomorphs with different, this and that they've got to start putting some kind of structure in place for their comic book universe. Right. Like at some point for it to for it to be able to continue, you know, I mean, yeah, I don't know. that's that's my opinion. Not that everything has to be, you know, a sequel to the other thing. But like we need some shared events and we need some shared continuity to really like understand the universe that we're in. See, it's funny you say that because I was just about to say I really like the approach that Marvel has been taking to their comic books where every arc is just like a self-contained right. story that is unique to every other thing they've been doing. And then right before I was about to say that, you're like, they need to have the stuff cross over no, more. No. And I was like, I was about me, to say they shouldn't do that. Let me be very clear. I don't mean they need to have the stuff cross over more. I'm not arguing for, you know, heavy, heavy intertwined continuity. But like we saw Project Alpha show up on in a in Batia's uh, stuff in Thaw, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a connection. We know that they know about the Project Alpha stuff. She knows about it. People know about it. It's been out there, right? Uh, I'm saying whatever the next series is, I think, like, if Jun Yutani shows up or if Jun Yutani gets mentioned, like, that kind of stuff. Like, we need some sort of... We need more fixed points and fixed events in this than just Alien and Aliens happened, right? I got you. Because okay, like yeah okay now I get what you're saying yeah. okay yes all right you know so we need somebody else who was involved I mean we don't these are I'm throwing these out as ideas right I'm not the writer I'm not of course but like let's let's reference the Clowley mining colony down the line let's say like though this specimen was recovered from Clowley after that event with with Jun Yutani in the synthetic or whatever and then we've got a little nod to Dayton in another story, but we're not focusing on Dayton or Clowley, but we know that the events that happened there mattered to the larger universe in a way. Does that make sense? I, I like the way you put it when you said there needs to be more fixed points other than just alien and aliens. Right. When you said that, it really clicked into pay, place exactly what you meant. You're not saying that you want there to be like crossovers or no. whatever. You're just saying that you don't think the comics are doing good enough of a job of putting these stories in the context of like the greater alien timeline. Right. And I'm, and I think that Thaw and Thaw and Descendant did a good job of creating a lot of these events. I just want, I just want to see, I want to see what happened here in this storyline matter somehow in a future storyline. That's that's all well, I'm saying. 
Um, I will point out to the listeners that as of when we're recording this, this comic came out four days ago. Yes. So um, we have not yet had the opportunity to find out if it's going to become relevant later yeah. or not. I'm just hoping it does because the other stuff didn't really seem to be. And like, what's our next comic series? We're getting the black, white and black, white and blood, which is a series of one shots, from different creators. Mm-hmm. And then we're getting, we didn't talk about this up top. The, uh, the Marvel What If, uh, What If Carter Burke Survived Aliens, that's being written yeah. by um, Paul Reiser. Paul Reiser and his son. I couldn't pull his son's name. I still can't. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. Yeah. And Paul Reiser's son, no disrespect to you, sir. I just don't know your name off the top of my head. So I don't. So I don't think we're gonna. I mean, we're doing a. We getting. We're getting a What If story, which I'm very fucking excited about. Just to be clear, and then we're gonna get a series right. of these Black, White, and Blood one shots. So. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's prime territory for them to reference some things that have happened in the other Marvel books. Uh, since we just very briefly talked about it, I'm gonna throw my two cents into it. I, on the other hand, could not fucking care less about that what if story. <laughs> oh man! I, don't I mean, know. of course, of course, I'm going to read it because it's an alien comic, and like, I'd like to see what they do with it. But like, the idea of what if Carter Burke survived the events of Alien or Aliens does not interest me at all because he's a bad guy, and I didn't like him, and I don't want him to survive the story. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm interested in what happens there because, you know. Yeah, no, he's not a. He's clearly not a good guy, but he's also just a guy who was like way out of his league and way out of, out of his element. And I don't think fully understood what he was doing and made a lot of bad decisions as a result. I'm not an. I'm not a Carter Burke apologist. I want to be very clear. Uh, I kind of sounds like you are. No, honestly, I just really like Paul Reiser, and I love that Paul Reiser is is co writing a, a Carter Burke comic book series. Come on. Come yeah, it just that doesn't that doesn't really have any interest to me. It's just like, you know, right. I've gone on record that like I'm not as big a fan of that movie as everyone else is. Yeah. And he was not even close to the most compelling character in that movie to me. He is not someone that I am interested in reading more comics about. Like if I had to pick a character, he would not even be in like the top <laughs> half of the list of characters I just, from that movie. I just that that idea, that hook just doesn't fucking do anything for me. Yeah. OK, that's fair. I, I have faith it's going to be uh, an interesting, fun read. And, and I like that they're taking a weird swing like that. Right. Because that that is one thing. That is a good point that I will give you. That is an yeah. insanely weird choice. And so I support them, support them doing weird choices right. like that. I mean, they could have gone like, what if Vasquez survived? Right. What if, you know, they, they could have gone other ways with it. What if Hudson? I don't know, you know, like, but they're like, nah, what if Carter Burke survived and we got the guy who played him in the movie to co-write the series? You know, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting. I like to see them do more interesting alternate universe things like that because yeah, I mean, it's, like I because said, it's fun, you know. I'm like, I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to read it and go into it and be like, all right, uh, I hope this book surprised me. But just like the log line just does not interest me at all. Fair. <laughs> like okay. this is a comic that based on premise alone, I would not be reading if I wasn't doing this show. <laughs> gotcha. I mean, again, my opinion might change after I read it. I might read it and go, wow, this comic's really good. I, you've changed my mind, but just... Just based on the premise, I'm out. <laughs> sure. I got one other thing. Go, um, go for it. The website that I use, they left. There's a couple of people that left comments on it. Um, a user four days ago uh, left the comment, "I know like," <laughs> and it Boo. and it got and it got three thumbs ups. Okay. And then three days ago, somebody responded. Agreed. The ending was garbage. Boo. And that's it. That is all of the comments on this comic. All right. So we So at least two people out there did not like the way Descendant ended. Maybe those two people didn't read Thaw or those two or three people or however many didn't read Thaw. I will say I it is an it is an ambiguous ending. I would like a little bit of finality on it mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, but I'm okay with this. I'm okay with I'm I'm okay with not having answers to everything, right? And I think that yeah, it, I think that as Zasha's monologue here says, 
I returned to my home to find what I lost, and despite even more chaos I did, now we're all together again, buried in a silent cold. Because remember, she also found her mother's body as she was walking back through the keg to find Dayton. Like, I think that we have, that is, I think that that is a good, it's a dark ending, but I think it's a good ending. I mean, for this to be a story about a character trying, like, for this whole thing to be a story about a family, and this, uh, these four issues particularly being about a survivor of an event trying to go back and find her family and find closure and find answers for those things. I think it's very successful. I mean, I don't, okay, how should I phrase this? I don't like the ending in that it doesn't make me like feel good now that I've read it, but it, uh, I'm trying to think of a better way to phrase this than the way I was about to say it. It strikes me as a, not necessarily fully satisfying, but a satisfactory way to wrap up the storyline. Um, I generally, I don't love it when the end of a storyline is just, let's just kill everyone. But yeah. um, that's kind of what it did. But in this situation, I kind of think it works. I mean, would I have liked to see Zasha escape? Yeah, of course. Right. But, um, but her, but that's, you know, the see, fact, that's that, but the, the fact that she, the fact that she didn't, Hey, that's how it goes, you know? Right. But she escaped and she came back. So then for her, this whole journey for her to then be just escaping again, that then why did she come back in the first place? You know what I mean? Well, like, if the comic ended with her escaping, she wouldn't have come back. You know, I mean, I know I'm saying like in thaw, she escaped. This comic book is about her coming back. She shouldn't escape again. She came back to find Dayton and she did like, like she came like and she came back I mean she basically came back to die you know that wasn't her plan but yeah that was what she was okay with that was what she ultimately mm-hmm. wanted that's why she turned around to save him from uh June Yutani the robot that's why she stayed because she was like no I I came back to find you and I have and I'm staying here with you and with and with mom in the other room you know <laughs> like that's the one thing I mean, this comic I've, they miss is they should have dragged Bati's fossilized body in there with them. I, uh, I've i gone on record that, generally speaking, I don't love it when a story ends with the main character dying. Sure. Like, I mean, I'm not one of those guys that it's like, oh, I have to feel good by every single ending of everything I read. It's like, I understand that there are, like, narrative reasons why that would be the most satisfying or best way to wrap something up. And so I'm not saying that that's the reason I don't love it, but it's like she is the main character. We did like her. We did think she was charming and cool. We had gotten to know her and she was only like in her mid 20s. I yeah. would have liked to see her live, but I mean, that's not how the writer decided the story needed to end. So that's just how it goes. But even from like a character perspective, like that's not what she wanted again, if like, this is what I'm I'm talking about. Like, I'm getting into Zasha's head here, right? She escaped in the, at the end of Thaw. She could have stayed gone. She came back because she needed to come. Like, she was driven to find Dayton, right? She had the opportunity to, again, escape now and get in uh, the Corvette, as I called it, and fly away. But she's... But, no, she... Like, this wasn't... This wasn't, like, some shitty, like, the only way for for us to save the day is for me to sacrifice myself this wasn't a sacrificial moment for her she wasn't sacrificing anything she was just she was getting exactly what she wanted right it's hard to it's it's weird to argue like no she died and it's a good ending like i understand that just doesn't feel right but again this wasn't a heroic sacrifice moment this was just her being like no i want to i want to hang out with my dad like (laughs) and and that's it i came all this way to do this and i'm gonna do it that's how I that's how I view it and that's how I f- feel about it and that's why I feel like it's got this like it's it's ending kind of hopeful right I mean let's talk again June Utani is deleting these files from this incident he just heard all of the stuff uh that they had said uh like I think he's having a reaction to like he's deleting these files and this whole thing and giving up on this plan because he heard Zasha calling Dayton her father this man who has like hated synthetics his whole life, use them as tools, uh, clearly, obviously. And uh, like, I don't know, man, I think I think that like that relationship has even impacted June Yutani, real June Yutani by the end of this comic book. 
I'm a little all over the place here. I just, I don't know. I think it, I think it is a pretty strong ending. The more I'm thinking about it, you know, these are first impressions. Of course, everybody like I, I might change my mind if I reread this, but I think it really worked. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm not like opposed to it. It's, it is not the ending I personally would have preferred for like, you know, maximum satisfaction for the characters in the story. But like, I'm not saying it doesn't work or that it's bad. You know, it's it's perfectly fine. I don't think the ending is garbage like those uh, commenters said it was. So it's fine. Uh, also, uh, Leon Reiser is writing. With, okay. Written by Paul Reiser, Leon Reiser, Adam F. Goldberg, Hans Rodionoff. Man, I am so bad with names sometimes. And uh, Brian Volk Weiss. So there are five writers on this Aliens What If series. <laughs> Which isn't uh, an ideal situation. I mean, you don't love it when there's a whole bunch of writers on one thing. I got to say, the um, cover for the second issue is hilarious. It's two xenomorphs like grabbing some guy by the face while Paul Reiser sneaks by in the background with an ovomorph. <laughs> I got to pace. Yeah, it. like... I think another reason why thing. that <laughs> I think another reason why that comic kind of bugs me is because um, them doing an aliens what if yeah. means that like the standard Marvel cape shit oeuvre is finally <laughs> starting to leak into the aliens franchise. Oh, and black like, white because and like, blood isn't big, you know. Big, well, because, well, yeah, true, I suppose, Red, White, and Blood, they've already been doing, but, like, What If is, like, an established Marvel thing right. that they've been doing for decades that they do for all of their fucking superhero comics, and now Aliens is getting a What If, and it's like, bro, that's a superhero thing. Keep that separate from this, my yeah, man. I think it's, I think it's fine. If, they, if they're like, uh, Aliens, What If Newt's Tale was canon, you think I wouldn't be on board for that? Come on. Aliens. What if original uh, sin? Sorry, you asked me that while I was taking a drink from my <laughs> beverage, so I couldn't respond. Sorry. I think I think I think what ifs are a great way for them to maybe. I mean, they're obviously they're starting with something, you know, movie related, but like, it could be a fun way for them to bring in some weird continuity shit, like aliens. What if the engineers were actually those the the dudes we see in the old Dark Horse comics, and you know, like, what were they? The Malakok? Is that what they were called in Original Sin? right yeah i believe so aliens what if prometheus but it's those guys instead of the engineers come on you wouldn't read that i mean i'd read it but only because i'm doing the show all right fine <laughs> i mean it's one of those things where it's like alien already has a whole like a big issue determining what kind of stuff is or isn't canon right. and like that changes over the course of time on theoretically any new story that's released yeah and now they're just like oh here's a whole story that it's like none of it matters at all and we're just telling you that outright from the beginning and it's like why bother then maybe that's why i'm so interested in it because i don't care about canon um like i i like them like i it feels like an opportunity for them to just have this big playground to play with all kinds of concepts and ideas much like mark verheiden was doing back in the you know 80s right like they don't have to stick if they're doing what if stories they don't have to stick to whatever canon is they get to just make up their own canon yeah. and that's what that is honestly more interesting to me than uh than trying to fit everything into a specific box i mean i've made my i've made my feelings on canon clear in this i i don't particularly care and i think when something is as broad as the alien franchise you should be able to pick and choose the things that you like and don't like and not not be too worried about which things count and don't count because everything has some its own thing to say, right? So I don't know. Sure, but like, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm going to like push back against what you said or anything. Because your your comment is correct, and I agree right. with it. As we discussed during the Newt's Tale episode, yeah. my difference is though is that like Newt's Tale and Outbreak and stuff. When that stuff was made. It was intended to be real okay. and then later on was relegated and changed this. What if from the very beginning, they're like, you can just discount the story entirely. We're telling you out front that none of this stuff mattered at all. I hear That's it. the difference to me. I get I get what you're saying. That that makes a lot of sense. I, I get it. I, yeah, it, the, I'm that's still... the one difference to me. It was never intended right. to be real in the first place. Is very, the difference. very fair point. 
you know, it, I mean, honestly, we'll see how it shakes out. Like, I, I think, it, I, I mean, think it's going to be a fun read, but I understand you're like, yeah, but like, you're telling me it doesn't count, so it's wasting my time, right? It, it has going to have no bearing on the next thing that I read. It's the opposite of what I was just saying, where I was like, you know, I hope they have some references yeah. to these things, and they, and I can really start feeling like this stuff matters to a universe. And, like, the only time this what-if will ever come up again is if they do another what-if that, like, follows up on the events of this one. It's like, Fair yeah, it's, it's never going to come up again. We're never going to see this stuff again. And we'll never have the chance to find references to it anywhere. Absolutely. You know, it's, and point. it's like, like, on the other hand, though, it does feel kind of like when... Uh, that one episode of the Simpsons where uh, they were talking to Lucy Lawless and they're like, Oh, what about such and such X thing that happened in Xena? And she's like, uh, it was a wizard that did it. Right. And it's like, it, it feels like kind of one of those <laughs> things where it's like, I'm just, I'm just like nitpicking nerd shit that doesn't actually matter. And yeah. it's like, even as we've gone on record before, canon can be whatever we want it to be. Yes. So none of this stuff really even matters, but it's like, it just it kind of bugs me when they're like, oh, this thing absolutely does not matter. And we're telling you that up front. That's the thing that bothers me, because it's like I'm not OK, yeah. I'm going to step back one more step <laughs> and go. That's the problem that I have with the entire what if concept to begin with. Uh -huh. Like if the what if version of a story X was more interesting or a story you wanted us to tell that should have just been the story that you told me in the first place. I get, you know? I, yeah, I under, I understand your perspective on this completely. And, and you raise a yeah. lot of really good points. So, I mean, you know, bottom line is we're still going to read it and we'll see. Oh how yeah. We feel I mean, about that's it. the thing. Like I'm still going to read it. I'm still going to go into it being willing to give the comic the benefit of the doubt, but like, the the hook just doesn't really interest me yeah. so the comic is going to have to do some work to get me to like it but that being said i hope i do like it because i don't want to go into something going oh i hope this is going to suck i want the <laughs> thing i spend my time doing to be good right. you know <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm hoping it. it's good but i'm not necessarily expecting to be wowed by it sure. unless the comic fucking pulls out all the stops yeah so should we wrap it up? I think uh, I think we've yeah. We, I don't have anything else. We've gone on about a lot of things on this. Uh, ultimately, I think we both recommend reading Alien Descendant, but especially reading Alien Thaw before you read Alien Descendant if you haven't. Right? I do think Correct. you're. I think you're right, Kenny. Somebody could probably just pick this up and get up to speed and caught up with it. But I do think it'll mean more if you read Thaw, and I do think that they should not have reset the numbering between the two series. For sure. I mean, you won't, if you pick, if you start just reading Descendant, if you pick up issue one of Descendant, you won't have five issues of context about what's happening. But the comic does make it clear that it's like, she's there to find her step, or I was going to say her stepbrother, her stepfather, right. who is a synth. And she's there to find him because she's important to him. And June's there to try to get him. And it's like, they give you enough context to understand what's going on, but yeah. like, you'll miss out on a lot of like the details if you don't read yes. thaw first. So read thaw first. Yeah. And okay. One last thing I think I'll answer for both of us, even if this can stand on its own, I think essentially what we're saying is if somebody was new to alien books, you wouldn't start them on Descendant, right? But I would start them on Thaw and have them, like, be like if you like Thaw, you should check out Descendant as well. That's something that we've yeah. talked about previously with ARCs. Like, is this a good jumping on point for somebody? Yeah, uh, like, I would agree with you. Descendant is not, but Thaw is. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. we're in agreement. Guys, support your local comic shop. Buy these books. Yeah, I mean... The the only thing that matters as far as the stories that had come before are you have to be familiar with the events of Alien and Aliens and then a couple episodes or a couple issues in the beginning of Thaw make uh, minor references to a Project Alpha that if you hadn't read Bloodlines, you won't, won't know what that is. But it also but doesn't matter. But if you matter. don't know what that is, it doesn't matter at all because whatever, whatever Project Alpha is, is 
is not relevant to the plot. Yes. They just mention it offhandedly while talking about something else. Yeah. So that's like the only thing. So yes. <laughs> Crew, future Hallstrom and future Warbuck are here. What up? Cutting into this uh, broadcast. What like is what is it? Two days after we recorded this thing. Um, it's currently uh, Tuesday. So yes, two days yeah. later. And only hours before this releases on the podcast feed. <laughs> I actually already have the entire episode edited and uploaded uh ready to go. But in in uh in doing the edit earlier today, I thought, man, there's a few things about this Marvel story arc about alien descendant that I don't feel like we hit hard enough in our discussion. Mm-hmm. And that is kind of a byproduct of the way we discuss these new comics, right? As initial reactions, reading them for the first time on the show. We have in the past sort of reevaluated things have we, as we've moved on to the next thing. Sometimes we discuss something, and it reminds us of something from something else we've done on the show, right? For sure. Brings up new points, new connections, all of those sorts of things. I just, I just want to get some of this in on this Descendant finale episode discussion in case we don't circle back to it, because I do have this big fear of the Marvel comics just sort of leaving things behind mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because because they've done that so many times so far. They they sure have. So, uh, yeah, I just had a few things I wanted to, to expand on a little bit more that have been sort of pinballing around in my brain since we read this book a couple days ago. And the big thing is the title of the book, right? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm sure all the listeners out there uh, are aware that the book is called Descendant. But uh, since this is dropping in at the very end of the episode, you probably would have noticed that that never really came up and we never really discussed it or postulated as to why. So yeah. here we are. We didn't at all. And it is a little bit of maybe a, a, a foregone reasons why, but it still escaped our discussion. Right now, in the context of the story, the descendant is literally the ship that came to LV-695 with Jun Yutani and uh, Zasha posing as Cole. Mm -hmm. That was the transport ship that brought everybody to the ice moon to raise the Boreas. Uh, It's the ship that we see at the end of the book in in, uh, space, like under the portrait of Zasha and Mm -hmm. Dayton and Batia, which I I identified earlier in this recording in this episode as Jun Yutani's ship, referring to his his, uh, yacht, right? Yeah, but it's not. It's the descendant, right? And I think that it was that last panel there that really made me think like, man, we we did not really talk about the uh, the way that word descendant applies to this book because it really does apply in a number of ways that I think are um pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. So aside from being the name of the ship, right? The idea of uh, a descendant is is present in like every single aspect of this story like i mean from like the very basic version of uh, or from like the very basic concept of like the hybrid xenomorphs even right yeah the the xenomorph life cycle in general the chest bursters being descended you know i mean like in the most literal sense of like like offspring right yeah but beyond that like the idea of uh just family and familial descent and everything is just like such a huge part of this book. I mean, it's the reason that Zasha goes back to LV six nine five to find Dayton, you know, her, her stepfather, Mm -hmm. uh, because like, you know, it's, it's the only father that she's known, right. Even though he's not her biological father and he's a synthetic, like that's her family, you know, (laughs) sure is. And like, you know, the, the Zasha that we meet in this book is a very different Zasha than we met, than we spent time with in Thaw because she's been so informed by the things that Dayton did for her in order to enable her to escape and survive in the first place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now she's just like, was just out there all alone and she's desperate to come back and like find her, her family, you know, her mother also, right? And of course Dayton who like is her father in this story, you know, she yeah. is his descendant. Right. Yep. 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 Uh, and then on the other side of the coin, we've got uh, June Yutani showing up in a, a synthetic, you know, a synthetic version of him showing up, like recapturing his youth. He's just presenting himself as this young man 
Yeah, he's not quite recapturing his youth because he wasn't like robotically or he wasn't like remotely controlling it or whatever. No, but yeah, I, I, I thematically though I understood right. what you meant. I get you. And and going on uh, with Dayton about how uh, yeah he's a Utani, but he's not like a capital Y Utani. Yeah, you, you know he's not like a member of the main branch family. You know, sure he's a he's a yeah. he's a branch off. You know he's he's a cousin to the wealthy ones. Right, the big deal, Wayland Utani Utanis, yeah. and he's like clearly got like a chip on his shoulder about that. You you sort of get the impression from like his plan to raise the Boreas to give it back to his cousins to recover their property for them is like some weird thing he's doing to try to get back in their good graces be considered yeah, like it's, part of the family, right? It's one of those things that it didn't really hit me at the time when I was reading it cuz I had just read it right then, yeah. but with a couple of days now that I'm thinking about it, I got to say that's some real pathetic ass shit, dude. Kinda, what a loser really, that guy is. It really is, and we see him alone at the end, this old man with nobody else around, as if he doesn't yeah. have a legacy of his own. He's trying to mm-hmm. like He's he talks about how he's capitalized on the name, you know, but he's not really one of them. And he's trying to, like, get in yeah, with like, them because he just he doesn't have anything. In a lot of ways, uh, Dayton yeah. is his legacy or was, I guess, I yeah. suppose, which really, uh, you know, is emphasized by the fact that, you know, he went out of his way to create a synth- synthetic duplicate of his younger self, right. i.e., the version of him that Dayton would recognize specifically to be sent out to bring Dayton back all in an attempt to be like, Hey, rich side of the family, here you go. Can I have some of that money now, please? Yeah. This thing about his, his history with Dayton as well is so interesting because Dayton is the one who allowed the specimen, the xenomorph from the, um, the Clowley mining operation to escape. And mm-hmm. then he was the one who destroyed it, thus stopping uh, and, Jun Yutani's plans. Like, like he, you know, they all, you know, how all the Wayland Yutani guys get kind of weird about xenomorphs. Like it's their and and another thing know. that just hit me right now. Yeah, uh, that whole shit show that happened under Jun Yutani's watch at Clowley yes. might be part of the reason why he's not one of the capital Y Yutani family. That might have yeah. like. Dayton may have completely fucked his life up. Fucked you know? his life up and destroyed his legacy, right? Yeah, Capturing the xenomorph, sure. providing this thing, like his other way into the family, right? Yeah. Yeah, man. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's pretty fucking layered, you know? And yeah. And like, it's great because like all this stuff is stuff that, like, you know, as by the fact that we're sitting here talking about it. Yeah. This is all stuff that's in the book. It is. But like, because I was reading it and talking about it at the same time, I didn't really have the chance to like really think about it or process the story in front of me on the level necessary to put those kind of pieces together. I was just taking it in and going, all right, this happened and that happened. Cool. That was fun. All right. Next one. Exactly. Yeah. And with all of this stuff, like reconsidering all of these things, I'm sure there's other connections, right? I mean, geez, there's there's the 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 queen, the hybrid queen birthing out of whatever the queen version, the winter beast is, mm-hmm. right? The hybrids versus the XX one two ones. Oh, one minor note here: we did see a hybrid queen in the annual. I had totally forgotten about that. We see a hybrid queen fighting a regular queen, which is pretty sick. I um, don't remember that, but I do believe you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's at least a very, very large hybrid. You know, there's no text in that, so I'm pretty sure that's what we saw. But yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't remember it, yeah. but I do know that I like I can say with confidence that when I was reading it, I did notice it then. I'm just right. not recalling it right now. That's all. Yeah, but yeah. So anyway, like even just like the the idea of like a new species of xenomorph descending from you know, the, the XX one, two ones and the winter beasts, like Mm -hmm. even that's just, I mean, that that's a given, right? That's sort of, that's what xenomorphs do is what I'm trying to say here, but it's still (laughs) like thematically ties the monster stuff to the rest of the stuff, right? Like this Mm -hmm. concept Mm -hmm. of lineage and everything that's in this book. Cause one thing that we kind of criticized was like the monster parts felt separate from 
the Dayton coal uh, Utani parts, right? Yeah, for sure. But there's a thematic connection there that I don't think we were uh, picking up on as we were first reading it. And considering all of these things, I think I'm going to re- rewind a little bit of what I said earlier, mm-hmm. which is that I do think that Descendant is made better by Thaw, but I also think that it has a lot to offer on its own. I don't think it's my favorite still. Like I still enjoyed the Thaw sections better, but Mm -hmm. I want to be more generous to Descendant. I think it's a better book than I was giving it credit for on its own. I think it's got a lot more stuff going for it than maybe we realized after having just read issue four. For sure. And that's why I really wanted to hop on the mic and, uh, and talk about these things that we were kind of kind of missing in the original recording. And I think that we need to leave ourselves space to do this in the future, especially if we're going to be covering the comics in the same way as we have been, where we just sort of read it and give initial impressions. I think yeah. that uh, we need to leave room for us to go back and reevaluate those things. Yeah, I'm okay with that idea. Because, you know, yeah. th- things change. Like, I mean, that doesn't mean we're going to go yeah. back and reevaluate bloodlines, everybody. Some some stuff <laughs> yeah, I, is not going to require I, it. I I'm telling everyone right now I have no intention on reevaluating bloodlines. I'm perfectly okay with where it is in the rankings right now. <laughs> but yeah, I think I don't you know you know this is going out with this episode because that's just kind of how it happened. You yeah. know, we had the time before it released to go over these things. I don't know how we'll handle it in the future. And, and if anybody uh, has any ideas, shoot us an email at mother at net or comment on this under the YouTube version, right? Yeah. Because one thing, idea I'm kind of kicking around is maybe when we want to do these reevaluations, we'll just do them as sort of short, uh, short recordings that, you know, either we'll drop them in the feed as bonus episodes, maybe just put them up on YouTube. Maybe put them somewhere else on social media. I, I don't know. Maybe we'll start a TikTok because I think they let you do 10-minute videos now, right? Oh, you know what else we could do? <laughs> um, if there were, you know what else we can do is if there are a f- if there's like a couple of different things yeah. that we wanted to, you know, you know, elaborate on, follow up on, have further discussion about whatever, we could gra- we could gather together like two or three of those and then just do an entire episode where it's just, you know, reevaluating sure, yeah. and following up on these like four stories or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, again, this is all just theoretical right. us brainstorming stuff. So. Yeah. And, you know, the show's going to, we'll, we'll try some different things out and see what sticks. If, if anyone has yeah. any good suggestions, we're uh, always up for hearing those. Because the big thing is, like, you know, we're fans of the series. We don't consider ourselves experts. That's for sure. We learn things and our opinions are going to change about things as we go. That's the fun of doing the show, right? If we already knew everything about Alien, I don't think we'd be having any fun doing this, right? For sure. So for sure, you know, the show's going to change and grow as, uh, our, as, as we do. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how it goes. Right. For sure. That's, that's making a podcast, baby. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's kind of all. Do you have any more sort of thoughts on uh, descendant before we wrap this up for the second time? Well, uh, short answer is not really, but the long answer is I haven't like, you know, read it, right. uh, since then. Uh, you know, in the last couple of days, I haven't like reread it or anything, yeah. but um, I did finally get my e-reader in uh, the other day and Hell I've yeah. been uh, loading up a bunch of books on it and I've been loading up all of the alien books, all the, like all of the alien novels onto it. Every single and one. so it's been and every single one as of right now, as far as I know. And um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's gotten me thinking about like all of the like expanded universe alien material right and uh so because descendant is the most recent one that i read of it i've just been you know we were talking earlier on in you know the main part of the episode that we already did about how uh you know so like we were having a little bit of a trouble like you know the book didn't really do a whole lot to really like cement it in you know, cement the story in the place that it takes place in and put it in the context of like the other stuff around. Right. And, uh, that was one thing that, um, I both, I, I don't know quite how I feel about it because I, on one hand, I do kind of like it, but other parts of me don't like it as much. Yeah. How that is 
that's what Marvel's approach has been. Like how you said, like basically every story is just a standalone story, right. just tells that and then moves on to the next one, which is diametrically opposed to uh, the move that Dark Horse took when they got the license in the late 80s. They're like, not only is this going to be serialized and interconnected, yeah. but it's specifically and explicitly going to be continuing ongoing adventures of right. characters you already know uh, yeah. and so and, and at and least then until Mar alien 3 comes out <laughs> well sure <laughs> but, but then, they couldn't yes. have predicted that happening but yeah they were like we're going to yeah. tell serialized ongoing stories about characters you're already familiar right. with and then marvel gets the license and we're like we're just going to do the first movie over and over and over again yeah. in different circumstances they're all just going to be standalone not really interconnected they're more thematically connected than actually narratively you know right. and all these other things and it's just looking at all you know finding all these copies of all these old aliens novels and stuff, like I said, got me thinking about like the non movie parts of the franchise. Yeah. And it reminded me about what I was thinking of the other day, uh, when we were doing the episode on descendant that on, to be honest, I kind of just forgot about cause we started talking about something else. Yeah. But yeah, I just, you're like, you know, you know, I want it more like contextually relevant yes. in location with the other stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of like what dark horse did. And Marvel's kind of just like doing their own thing now, you know? Right. I think the, the term I use was I want more fixed points, right? Because yes, that, that is the term you use. Everything just like those intro pages, just reference alien and aliens. Right. I want to know, mm -hmm. and, and everyone is just discovering Xenomorphs for the first time in all of these stories. I want a story where somebody already knows what they are. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know that this one was that, right? And be, yeah. like, this was a continuation, which is probably what's made me start thinking about how desperately I need that. Like, again, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't need continuity and characters always like following the same set of characters over and over yeah. and over again. But I need someone to know what a xenomorph is. I need a story like the Cold Forge, where it's like we've already got some xenomorphs and shit's gonna go bad, right? Like. Yeah. Yeah, I need more big events and I need to know that the events I'm spending my time reading about are going to matter to something else in the story. I need this Clowley mining colony thing to have a purpose. Yeah, like it it doesn't need to be Star Wars where right. every single moment of entire decades long spans is accounted for somewhere. That's not what I, that's no. not what you're looking for. No, I don't want you know, that. No, but all. it's just like you do want to like you want the story to be aware that it takes place in a larger universe yes. where stuff other than this story has happened. Yes, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I, I get you. and I get you. that some of these things are impacting other things, right? Things. Yeah. The stories need to have impact beyond just the, the four, six, or in this case, 10 issues that they rent that they run for. Well, then in that case, uh, this arc is a positive development because we did get an arc that directly references and follows yes. up from a previous one. Andy, so. Andy, as we already mentioned, also name drops Project Alpha. So we know that's floating yep. out there. All right. I think yeah. I'm, I think I'm good on on this. Um yeah, I don't. In, I don't think I really have much of anything else. Yeah. So let's shut it down so I can find a place to insert this into the episode. This additional twenty some minutes we've recorded. It's going to be fun for me to load up the episode tomorrow and then discover in real time where you decided to put this. Yeah. Uh, I'm. This is definitely coming after or before the plug, so we're not doing them again. <laughs> I wasn't right. planning on it. Don't worry. <laughs> this is definitely, I can guarantee you this is either coming after or before the plugs. <laughs> yeah. Save up to 20% or more. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> all right. All right, Kenny. Uh, all right, crew, everyone. Um, bye. We, we now return you to the past. See ya. Uh, I think it's time for us to get out of here. Maybe we should announce that I think the next thing we're doing on the show will probably be the first two issues of the Dark Horse crossover series, Aliens versus Predator versus Terminator. Mm -hmm. There is a chance uh, we will be doing a Predator versus Wolverine sort of interstitial episode if we need to for scheduling. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the next big thing is Aliens versus Predator versus Terminator. We're hoping to get Bob back for that. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. 
Well, uh, we're definitely going to try to, that's for sure. Yeah, and that's a four-issue series. We're going to, I think we'll just split it in two, do issues one and two, and then issues three and four as a following cool. episode. After that, it'll be time for River of Pain. I believe so. And we'll be closing the books on the Alien Resurrection chapter after River of Pain. I don't know how we're going to divide that one up yet. That's going to be at least two episodes. Uh, oh, for sure. Maybe even three. I don't know. Yeah, I'd be okay with cutting it into thirds, probably. Um, um, I plan on doing the audio drama and the book this time, right. as opposed to just the audio drama. So I uh, I ordered a nice, fancy, expensive e-reader over the weekend. Hell yeah. And, and it arrives on Tuesday, so I will also just be reading the novel. Yeah. Nice. And again... If alien books come out from Marvel in that period of time, we're going to make space to talk about those. And if we need some scheduling, you know, time, room to breathe on a schedule, we're going to try to get Danny back, do some Predator versus yeah. Wolverine, as that is our interstitial series for now. So, yeah, I don't know. Stay tuned. Maybe we'll tweet about it when schedules change, right? Yeah, uh, let's hope we remember to, yeah. Or Blue Sky about it. Where can people find us on the Internet if they want to keep abreast of the things we are talking about and covering? Well, the two things you just mentioned, our Twitter is at Crew Expendapod. Our Blue Sky is at Crew Expendable. Uh, you mentioned earlier you could email us at mother at crewexpendable.net. Yeah. Our website is crewexpendable.net. Our Instagram is Crew Expendable Pod. And our YouTube page is youtube.com slash at Crew Expendable. Hell yeah. I'm uh, on the internet at most places at Final Neil. That's Neil with an A. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky Threads, FinalNeil.com, Twitch, whatever. Uh, TikTok. Hey, when I post clips on uh, Instagram and uh, YouTube shorts, I also throw them up on my TikTok. If So if you're not like an Instagram person, maybe you're a TikTok person, go follow me there and you'll see clips from podcasts I do including this show and MK PodQuest, a show about Mortal Kombat stuff that is coming to a close soon. We did finally wrap up the Jeff Rovin novel. Uh, but check that show out too, mkpodquest.com. Kenny, where can people find you on the internet? <laughs> this MF using threads. <laughs> Actually, I've, I've <laughs> used it maybe once. Nice. I uh, <clears throat> I remember when Threads first came out, you were thinking of using it, and then I said not to because Threads is linked to your Instagram account. Yeah. So if uh, in order to delete your Threads profile, you have to also de delete your Instagram profile, and yeah. you're like, absolutely not. Then yeah, but I you know for, for, not for the show because we may decide we don't want one or the other. Yeah. Right. As for me. I am on Twitter. I'm on Blue Sky. I'm on Letterboxd under the handle at D Y H O B B E Z. There may be other sites out there that I also use. If I do, I use that same handle on them, but those are really the only ones that I spend any meaningful time on. Yes. Our uh, default podcast art, podcast art you see on our website. And uh, as part of the background for the YouTube versions of these episodes was done by our friend Tom. Follow him on Instagram at art underscore of underscore Womtez, W-O-M-T-E-Z. Thanks again, Tom, for that incredible artwork. It rules so hard. Uh, he's cooking some other stuff up, up for us for banners and things like that as well. So go, go give him a follow on Instagram. His art is fantastic. He draws all kinds of stuff, not just xenomorphs. But the xenomorphs he draws are very cool. Mm -hmm. There's links mm -hmm. to all of this stuff down in the description. So uh, go nuts, everybody. That's right. We'll be back to talk about Terminator stuff, probably. That'll be interesting. Hell yeah. Until then, stay, stay frosty. frosty.